Good evening, George's Creek. We're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles. We're going to open up to Hebrews chapter 3. This evening we're going to be looking at Hebrews 3, 7 through 19. And I want to thank you again for allowing me time to rest last week while I was sick. I needed it, and so thank you. Um, if you've been joining us for these Wednesday night studies, then you know we've been going through Hebrews. And when we were last together, we saw in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, that we are to consider Jesus. The author is saying that Jesus is greater than Moses. Remember that the recipients of this letter, they were tempted to resubmit themselves to Moses and the law. They had lives where it seemed like everything was out of control. And we talked about how in those moments, when, when that happens in life, we want control. We want to do anything we can to, to grab control and to feel like we have some sort of uh, control over our lives and our fates. And what the author to the Hebrews was saying was, look to Jesus. He's been tempted in every way that we're tempted. He knows how to relate to us. He, he was pointing our attention to the fact that if we were left to our own abilities, if we were left to our own strength, and we were left to deal with temptation on our own, we would be doomed. But we aren't. We have an apostle, the great high priest, Jesus, who is faithful over all of God's house. So the Bible continually points us away from ourselves into Jesus. And I feel like every week I'm saying, look to Jesus, consider Jesus, because that is the resounding message of the whole Bible, and especially the book of Hebrews. Keep looking to Jesus. He is greater. He is the one who is faithful over God's house and is able to help you when you're being tempted. So look to Him. And we're going to continue our study this evening with a, a sermon at a, a sermonal, as I've called them, a sermon devotional called No Rest for the Wicked. We're going to talk about the rest of God. So if you have your Bibles, look there at Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to read verses 7 through 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and just quick pause. This isn't the sermon, but this is just a great place to point out the inspiration of Scripture, that all of Scripture is inspired and God-breathed, uh, because the author of the Hebrews here is going to quote a psalm written by a human man, but he says, the Holy Spirit says. So there's a clear indication that Scripture is inspired. It's written, of course, by human authors, but God-inspired, and God has His way in Scripture of making sure that everything he wants to be said is said. So that's a beautiful place to see that. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let's pray together as we get started this evening. Father God, we come to you now in our last week of, well, Lord willing, virtual Bible study. We are eager to meet again uh, together for our Wednesday night night. 
times of study and devotion and prayer. And we ask, God, that you would bless our time together this evening. We ask that you would help us to understand your word because we want to be good students of your word, Lord. We want to see and behold wonderful things from your word. We want to interpret your word properly. We want to see the relevant message in your word, Lord, so that we might not make the same mistake as the recipients of this letter, but that we could be encouraged to look to Jesus. Help us, God. We, we do believe, but help our unbelief. Lord, we're so tempted to turn to our own strength and to try to control every aspect of our lives, but I ask that you would help us trust you more every day. Help us see and behold Jesus this evening. I pray in His name. Amen. Well, as I said, the title of the sermonal for tonight is No Rest for the Wicked. And what's amazing is there's this idea in the world, maybe you've encountered it, that no matter who you are, when you die, people are going to say, you're in a better place now. Or they'll put R.I.P. I don't know if people still put that on tombstones or not, but rest in peace. And uh, it, I, I've seen instances where, I mean, a, a person will die, and this person lived just an absolutely terrible life. This person rejected the gospel uh, all the time, would never even entertain the idea of the truth of the gospel. This person rejected Jesus. This person was a blasphemer. I I mean, I've seen it firsthand. And and then this person died, and his whole family starts saying, he's in a better place now. He can finally rest. He's resting in peace now. And that's a comforting message uh, that the world is putting out there, and it's going to comfort the family members for a time. But that is not the biblical message. In fact, what we're seeing in this passage is that the Bible says just the opposite. And what happens, interestingly enough, is you, you end up with this collide between worlds where the popular culture meets biblical truth and you see the collision happen. And this is apparent in a lot of instances, but one place is in a recent song that was released by a band called Cage the Elephant. The song is called Ain't No Rest for the Wicked. And that is from a Bible verse talking about how there will be no rest for the wicked. And it's actually not in our passage this evening. It's in Proverbs. But here is the chorus. It says, Oh, there ain't no rest for the wicked. Money don't grow on trees. I got bills to pay. I got mouths to feed. There ain't nothing in this world for free. Oh, no, I can't slow down. I can't hold back. Though you know, I wish I could. Oh, no, there ain't no rest for the wicked until we close our eyes for good. So close to the kingdom and yet just missed it by that much. And that's what we see. I mean, that's exactly what I was just talking about, where this unbiblical idea of just as soon as someone dies, they will enter into this rest. And as soon as someone dies, they're in a better place. That idea collides with biblical truth. And the the songwriters here say that the wicked will have rest when they close their eyes for good. But the passage that we're looking at this evening in Hebrews says the exact opposite. The big idea is that unbelief is the ultimate reason why people will not enter God's rest. In other words, we we have no reason to believe, and, and in fact it would be unbiblical to believe, that the wicked, when they die, will have rest. Uh, the Bible is emphatically clear that there will be no rest for the wicked. And that's not God's fault. That is on the human person. Because unbelief is what keeps people from entering God's rest when people refuse to uh, turn from their sins, when they refuse the grace and mercy of God that's extended in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's unbelief. And that will keep someone from entering God's rest. And so it's a very sobering message that we're looking at tonight. And, And the temptation for us right now, I know, is to say, well, I do believe. Therefore, why does this apply to me? And We're going to get to that in just a few minutes, but just know that this is a very serious passage, and it's not one we should take lightly. 
There will be no rest for the wicked. We have a simple structure for our passage this evening. You're going to see an illustration, some warnings, and some questions. And we're just going to look at it very, very generally together. So the illustration starts in, in verse 7. And, and what he's going to do is he's going to use an illustration of the wilderness generation. That generation that Moses led out of Egypt after God had delivered the people uh, with the ten plagues and, and then parted the Red Sea. And, and so this generation that Moses led out, the author of the Hebrews is going to use them as an illustration. And we're going to see some striking similarities between that generation and the people to whom the author is writing. The first thing he says is that this generation hardened their hearts. You see that there in verse 8. He says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. That generation hardened their own hearts. And what's so amazing and interesting about that is, if you remember the Exodus account, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then Pharaoh continued to harden his own heart. And that that group of people, that generation that saw the plagues, that saw everything that Yahweh did to deliver His people, ended up doing the same thing that Pharaoh did. They hardened their own hearts. He says also, they saw the works of God. You see that there in verse 9. He says, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Now here's what's amazing. is There are times in our lives where we will say, uh, this person, when he was a, a child, he seemed to have such great faith. Uh, it, it looked like God was at work in this child's life. He, he filled out a card. He, he said that he became a Christian. He had accepted Jesus into his heart. And it was evident that he loved God. It looked like he did, at least. And, and he was experiencing the work of God in his life. And yet that same child will go astray as an adult sometimes. And we're left wondering, how how does that happen? I thought that he saw the work of God in his life. I thought that he had made all these commitments. And the author here is saying, yeah, well, so did the generation that Moses led out of Egypt. They saw the work of God. Did God not do great things for them? God delivered them, after all, from slavery. God made sure to deliver them. That's a great thing that God did for them. He, he parted the Red Sea for him. He, he provided works for him, uh, manna from heaven, water from the rock, uh, quail. I mean, God just did continually good things for these people. They saw the works of God and benefited, and yet they hardened their own hearts. And this is also what God says. They always went astray in their hearts. Notice that, verse 10. Therefore I was provoked to that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So this isn't someone who uh, had salvation and lost it. No, this is, this is much more frightening. This is someone who benefited from the work of God in their life. This is someone who was partaking of the grace of God and yet always went astray. That wilderness generation, they didn't have salvation and then lose it. They never had it to begin with. It says they always went astray in their hearts. And that's the same that happens today. That instance that I I mentioned where you'll have a a child fill out a card and seem like they're on fire for the Lord and that they're they're seeing the works of God in in this child's life. And then when the child becomes an adult, he goes astray And you're like, what happened? Did he lose his salvation? Well, no, the Bible would say he never had it to begin with. That he hardened his own heart and he's always gone astray. You can be a partaker of the good things of God and yet not be a Christian. It happens all the time. And so the consequence is they did not enter God's rest They had every opportunity to enter God's rest. God held it out for them. God promised them, if you will just walk in the way, if you'll you'll obey these commandments, 
You'll enter the rest. And and here's what I want you to notice too. God doesn't tell them to obey the commandments so that they'll enter the rest as if He hadn't already done anything for them. God had already delivered them. And this is how God always operates. This is how you, you have to understand the Bible if you're going to understand grace and the gospel. The gospel is not do these things and then God will be pleased with you and He will bless you. The gospel is, this is what Jesus has already done for you. Believe in that, and in response to that, walk in His way. That's the same thing here. God had already delivered them. God had already poured out His blessings upon these people. And in response to those blessings, He expected them to walk in His way. But they refused. And it was because of their own decisions, their own hardness of heart, their own going astray that they did not enter God's rest. That's the illustration. And then there's some warnings. This is what he says in in verse 12. He says, take care, or maybe your translation says, watch out. It means to pay careful attention to something, to to devote all your attention to it. Don't, Don't be distracted by anything else. Get this, watch this, pay close attention. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Notice that. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. When we think of an evil heart, we automatically go to murder and adultery and and abuse and racism and all all these examples of of evil. That is evil. But the Bible also says an evil heart is an unbelieving heart. You might have an evil heart, not because you're a murderer, not because you're an adulterer, not because you're any other sin that you can think of. You might have an evil heart because you've got an unbelieving heart. And that's the sobering reality of biblical truth. The Bible never minces words. Jesus was never one to to hold back the truth. And the truth is, an unbelieving heart is an evil heart. And he calls Christians, notice that, he's writing to Christians, and he calls Christians to take care, to to watch out, to make sure that they don't have an evil, unbelieving heart. Why? Because an evil, unbelieving heart will lead you to fall away from the living God. That's what he says in verse 12. He says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And I heard a pastor say one time, uh, I think it was Dr. Herschel York, he said, when Christians hear falling away, they automatically think uh, falling away from grace into into something like murder or adultery or or fornication or, or, or any type of terrible sin. And he said, but if you read the Bible carefully, you'll notice that humans are much more likely to fall away from grace and into the law. And isn't that exactly what these people were struggling with? Right? They they had experienced the grace of God, and yet they were tempted to fall away from that back into the law, back into works. We do that same thing. We, We might not readily admit it or know it or recognize it, but we do it all the time. We've experienced the grace of God. If you're a Christian, you're you're born again, you're in Christ, and yet you still have indwelling sin. And you're still tempted, and you still stumble, and you still make mistakes. What happens when you make those mistakes? Do 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 you pour out your heart to God and mourn your sin and say, God, I hate that I'm still not like Jesus. I hate that I'm still struggling with sin. God, I hate the fact that I'm still giving myself to these things. Help me be more like Jesus. God, I am dependent on your mercy and grace. Or do you say, I've got to do something to make up for this? I've got to do something. I've got to to add to my church attendance. I've got to add to my Bible reading. I've got got to make sure I'm only listening to, to Christian songs this week we're much more likely to fall from grace and into works in the law than we are to fall from grace and into some heinous, terrible sin. That's the warning here. Take care, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart causing you to fall away. And he says this in verse 13, he says, 
but exhort one another. This is a command. This is something you should do. Exhort one another as long as it is called today. Why? That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is what hardens the heart. And the more the heart goes after sin, and the more that heart is not constrained, the more it's going to give itself to sin, and the harder the heart is going to become. And that's a very dangerous thing. He says in verse 14, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So it's just as I said the last time we were together, as we saw back in uh, chapter 3, verse 6, which says almost the same thing. It says, And we are His house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. The, the truest sign of a Christian faithfulness, the truest sign, I would say, of, of assurance of salvation. How can I be sure that I'm a Christian? It's continuation in the faith. It's continuation in the hope of the faith. I, I keep on believing the gospel. I keep on hoping in Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection and ascension. I keep holding on to that confidence that I had at the beginning, and I persevere to the end. That is the truest sign that someone is a Christian. Perseverance to the end. And so he says in verse 15, Today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, he's going to ask five questions here, and these five questions culminate in one statement. He says, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So those five questions, and they all culminate in this one statement. So we see that they were unable to enter, enter the rest of God, because of unbelief. Now, here's the question. We, we read all this, right? And, and we, we basically get it. We, we see that the author's drawing our attention to the wilderness generation. We, we see that there's a warning in there about make sure that we're not having an evil, unbelieving heart like they did. And we see that there's a, a command, exhort one another. Make sure that none of you are deceived by sin and harden your heart because that will cause you to fall away. And if you fall away... Uh, and, and continue in unbelief, you're not going to enter the rest of God. We get that, but there's another question we should be asking. And I think it's the key to understanding this entire, this entire passage. And it's this, it's why the wilderness generation? Why is he bringing this up right now? Because remember in, in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, he was saying that Jesus is greater than Moses. And we saw that they were tempted to submit themselves to Moses. So why the wilderness generation now? Well, they wanted to resubmit themselves to Moses. They wanted Moses to lead them. And they thought, remember this, they thought if Moses was leading them, things would somehow be better. Right? Isn't that what they were saying? They were saying, yeah, this Jesus is good, but we, we started following Jesus and all these bad things started happening. So maybe if we resubmit ourselves to Moses in the law, things would be better. Our lives would suddenly be, be different. We would somehow be pleasing in the sight of God. We would be able to be faithful because after all, Moses was faithful. So if we had Moses as our leader, if he was the one leading us, then surely we would be faithful now. And that's the key. That's why the author brings this up. Because he says, but remember the wilderness generation. Remember them. They were led by Moses. The wilderness generation had Moses leading them, and yet they still went astray. I mean, he highlights this uh, almost word for word in, in verse 16. He says, was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? You want Moses to lead you? That doesn't mean you would be faithful. That, that doesn't mean that you would all of a sudden be obedient and have a believing heart because Moses led this entire generation who saw some of the greatest works of God possible, and yet they still went astray. They still didn't believe. They still hardened their own hearts. So even if Moses was leading the people, that's no guarantee that they would be faithful. 
And that's the, that's the challenge for us as well, isn't it? Because how often in our own lives have we thought, man, if only I had this advantage or this advantage, if only I had been brought up here, if only I had learned this way or gone to this school, if only I had this situation, then my life would be better. If only I had uh, studied like that person, then, then maybe I, I would be able to understand things better. Maybe, maybe if, I, if I had a job that allowed me to read the Bible more, then I would read the Bible more and, and I could be more faithful. If I had a job that allowed me more free time to read the Scriptures. And what the Bible says repeatedly is that there's no other situation in which there's a guarantee that you would be more faithful. If you have heard the gospel message now, that is what you need to be faithful. God works through the proclamation of the gospel. And if He has worked in your heart through the proclamation of the gospel, then no other scenario is going to guarantee your faithfulness or guarantee that you would be more faithful in that situation. Just as there was no guarantee that if Moses was leading the people to whom Hebrews was written, they would all of a sudden be faithful again. We're tempted to think this in our own lives. If only I had more time, I would read the Bible more. If if only I understood it better, I would would read it more. If if only I I felt something in prayer, I I would pray more. There's no guarantee that you would be faithful in any other situation if you're not faithful now. But there are some connections. The first is that the heart is ultimately what causes people to go astray. It was what called the wilderness generation to go astray. It's what causes the, all, the recipients of Hebrews to go astray. It's what would cause us to go astray. It's ultimately our heart. Secondly, the, a similarity is the fact that every person is responsible for how he or she responds to the gospel. I was just saying that, that if you're not faithful now... What makes you think you'd be faithful in a different situation? If you've heard the gospel now, if God has worked in your heart now and you're not faithful, there's no guarantee you'd be faithful in a different situation. Sin deceives our hearts. It deceived the wilderness generation. The the recipients of Hebrews were being tempted by sin and it was deceiving their hearts into believing that they could somehow resubmit themselves to Moses, that they could somehow uh, be more faithful in a new situation. They were deceived by sin. Two other similarities is unbelieving hearts will cause us to fall away and unbelief will keep us from entering God's rest. Those all connect to our present day and we sense that in our lives. We experience all these things. So how do we, how do we respond? How do we as Christians respond to this passage? Well, as Christians... We must have a sense of gospel urgency. We don't have enough time to do it now, but I encourage you after you get done watching this video, or hey, pause it because it's recorded. So (laughs) you can pause it. Uh, Go back through this passage and circle the word today. Notice how many times that word appears. There's an urgency about this. Today, if you hear His voice... And exhort one another as long as it is called today. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. There's a sense of gospel urgency. And and as Christians, we should have this. We who have experienced the grace and mercy and love of God and who have been entrusted with the gospel message, we should have a sense of urgency to take that message out to others. As long as it is called today, we need to be winning people to Christ. We need to be asking the Spirit to send us to people in places who need the gospel message and we need to be ready to share that with them. There needs to be a sense of urgency. Jesus could come back at any time. You could drop dead tomorrow just like that. There's no guarantee, no promise of tomorrow. So as long as it's called today, we need to share the gospel and make sure that message goes out. Secondly, as Christians, we must emphasize responsibility. People in our world today hate responsibility. They, they want to point the finger at someone else. They want to blame others for, for their own actions. But as Christians, we need to emphasize responsibility. 
We need, to, we need to make sure people know that, hey, if you've heard the gospel message, if it's been communicated clearly to you and you are continuing in unbelief, that is your fault. That is you harden your heart. That is, that is not you being in any other situation would make that better. We have a responsibility for how we respond to the gospel. And ultimately, when everybody stands before God, they will give an account for how they responded to the gospel. He's going to judge people for how they respond to the gospel. So he puts that responsibility on everybody. How do you respond to the gospel? Do you love it? Do you treasure it? Do you you want to share it with others? Have you submitted yourself to it? Or do you reject it? How do you respond? We have to emphasize responsibility. Third, as Christians, we must stress the importance of community. I want you to notice this. This is so important, church. I need you, and you need me, and we need each other. And I don't even mean as the interim pastor. I just mean as a church member. We need each other. I want you to notice this. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I need brothers and sisters in my life to exhort me, to encourage me so that I'm not deceived by sin. Because listen, George's Creek, if if you left me alone, if I left you alone, if we left each other alone, and we isolated ourselves, our hearts would be deceived by sin. God has created the church, this community of believers, to build one another up, to to love one another, to exhort one another, to encourage one another. I heard an illustration one time that that compared Christians to embers in a fire. And basically, it said that you could take the, the brightest, hottest ember in that fire, you see it there, it's burning brightly. But if you remove it, even if it is the hottest and, and brightest ember and remove it and place it on its own, it'll go out very quickly. Why? Well, it needed the other embers to keep it going. They, they help each other. And so it is with the church. You could take the, the brightest star in the church, but isolate him on his own and he will be deceived by sin. Church, we need one another. So we need to emphasize this community. I need brothers and sisters who are going to come alongside me and say, hey, I see how you've been discouraged. I want to encourage you in this. Or hey, I I see how you have given yourself to this. Or I see this tendency in you. And I think you're being deceived by sin. I want to exhort you to reject that and believe in the gospel again. That is what the church is supposed to look like. Exhorting one another, making sure that we're not being deceived by sin. And what an important thing to do. This isn't just fulfilling an obligation. I, I want to make sure that you're not deceived by sin. And you should want to make sure I'm not deceived by sin. And we do that by exhorting one another. Fourth, as Christians, we must persevere in the faith. The Christian faith is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And we must persevere, but you cannot do that by your own strength, nor does God expect you to. Isn't that the good news of the gospel? God doesn't say, okay, you're justified, now go on your way, and you better hope you don't mess up. We're going to mess up. (laughs) If you could lose your salvation, you would have already. God doesn't expect you to be able to do it on your own. He's given you the church, the community, but more importantly, He's given you His own Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables us to persevere, no matter our circumstances, no matter our our financial troubles, no matter how we might be disappointed in certain situations in life, no matter the job prospects, no matter the economy, no matter what the situation is, we can persevere in all of life and in the faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. God enables us. He doesn't expect us to do it on our own. Yes, we are to to work and and work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but we do it empowered by the Spirit of God. Finally, as Christians, we must wage war on unbelief. Unbelief is is always trying to, to get at our hearts and deceive us. There are so many times in our lives where we have an intellectual knowledge, right? We, we understand things. We, we know the gospel message. We know the Bible. 
but our heart just doesn't feel it. It's like the man who told Jesus, Lord, I, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Anytime we, we are going after things that are not of God, anytime that we're giving ourselves to sin, we're not believing in the gospel. Anytime we're looking to our own intelligence, our own wisdom, our own craftiness, our own resources, our own strength, our own power, we're not believing in the gospel. Because if we believed in the gospel, we would know that we couldn't do it on our own. We can only do it because of God. Because Jesus has, has run the race for us, and now He is able to help those who follow after Him. He's the author and perfecter, the founder of our faith. So, Christians, we must wage war on unbelief. Every day, preach the gospel to yourself. The gospel is not just for unbelievers, it is for believers, and we need it every day. So wage war on your unbelief and preach the gospel to yourself. Let's pray. Father God, we know that we oftentimes think that if only we were in a different situation, we'd be more faithful. We know that we so often take tomorrow for granted thinking we'll live forever. And we know, God, that, that we often give in to unbelief and are deceived by sin. I pray, God, that You would help us. Re remind us of the Gospel every day, God. Help us to preach the Gospel to ourselves. I pray that You would not allow us to be deceived by sin, God, that we wouldn't harden our hearts but that as, as your church, we would be encouraging one another, building one another up, and making sure that no one is deceived by sin. Give us a, a sense of the urgency behind that, God, to, to make the gospel known, to believe the gospel today, as long as it is called today. And God, I pray that as we continue on in the faith, that we would come to rely more and more on your spirit, and that we would come to love Jesus more every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you have any questions uh, for us here at the church, feel free to fill out the contact form over to the side there. You can just hit that thing that says contact us. If you want to talk about salvation, if you have any questions about the Bible, if you need someone to pray with you, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And Lord willing, we will see you again in the auditorium on Wednesday.